So um, tonight we're gonna I'm gonna introduce you this novel use case that we developed at, at Helixa, which is the audience projection. Um, this presentation was done for the conference, so I'll skip to introducing myself because uh, you probably are very bored, and I'll also skip to explain what Helixa is because I guess Florian already did a great job. So just by recapping, Helixa is a platform where you can specify a target audience, for example, tell me the audience of the brand Adidas, and it will tell you everything about those people, like the interest, the psychographics, the influencers, demographics, and so on. So this is the major use case of, of a Higsa platform, okay? Um, what we're gonna see in the next, um, hopefully less than 45, 40 minutes, uh, we're gonna see some of the current challenges of traditional market research, and then we will show you this new framework of audience projection, which is leveraging both uh, techniques of named entity recognition and Bayesian inference. Okay, so what are the challenges in market research? Uh, in order to explain uh, what those challenges are, we first need to define what market research is. So I would like to ask if uh, somebody already know how many people already know what market research is. Okay, I mean, you already have a rough idea, that's already a good starting point. So market research is, at least this is my uh, view of market research, is, is done on three pillars. The first pillar is to gather information about individuals and organizations, but you're never going to get data about the whole population. So if we're talking about the US market, there's no way you can gather information about 230 million people, like 300 million people, there's no way. So generally, the approach you use is the statistical inference, so you get some data about a sample that, in, in our terms, we call the panel of users, and then from the panel, which is the sample, we infer about the graded population, right? Um, the way we analyze the data, uh, so the inference process, needs to have knowledge about social science, science in particular, the, the application of social science within the marketing industry, let's say. So if you combine those three things together, what you get is insights for strategic decisions. And this is the whole purpose of market research, is to get informed decisions, right? Why do decisions matter? It's because as Paul already introduced, uh, you can build buyer personas, you can segment the market, you can know what the preferences and behaviors of consumers are. Like, why do you buy this the cereals, uh, this brand, rather than this other brand. And um, you can get brand's perceptions. If you want to know how, for example, in the automotive industry, you have all the different brands, can be perceived as a sporty versus to be more classy, practical, or conservative. So these are all different features you can use for, uh, let's say, classifying different brands. Um, you can spot what are the trends, like this is like a new, very trendy, uh, drink, like Florian introduced in the previous example, then you want to find out. And uh, all this is because you want to, the ultimate goal is to identify opportunities, like bigger, better, greater opportunities for your business. Now, the mar market research traditionally is done, it, it follows two different approaches. The first one is the qualitative approach, where you um, you really know what your cus who the, your customers are, you invite them, for example, for a, uh, an interview, you create a study group and then you ask questions. So you get very detailed uh, insights about those people, but it's very limited to the number of people you can actually interview. Or you can follow the quantitative approach, where you work with numbers, <coughs> large, you collect large uh, samples of data and then you analyze afterwards. Of course, we're going to focus on the quantitative side of the market research. And the quantitative market research is traditionally done using surveys. So all the marketers, they define some questions, then they design the panel, that, so they have to design who are, how I'm gonna find those people to build my panel, how I'm gonna reach them. You, know, you design the whole experiment, and then you need to distribute this survey you need to collect the results and then you analyze them. So it's a, it's a quite a long journey. Uh, it takes some time and uh, there are some limitations. First of all, it's expensive. 
Secondly, you are only limited to predefined questions. If you want to add questions afterwards, you have to go back and find the same people of the last survey and then ask the additional questions, which is not practical. Um, response bias. This is really important. When you ask somebody, would you, how would you behave in that situation? Uh, he has to simulate, what, should, what would I do? If I, would I buy this or not? But you're not actually buying it. So you, you're, as an individual, as a human, you tend to give an answer based on what you expect other people you to answer, not actually based on what your you know, spontaneous uh, behavior would be. It's more based on the stereotype that is in your mind. And um, you have a narrow coverage, of course, because you know, as we said, you're not going to survey the whole <laughs> US population. And uh, uh, sometimes it's invasive. You have to go door to door, knock. Would you like to participate in this study? And so on. So it's not, it's not that practical in the end. For this reason, um, we have on the left the traditional way, and on the right, we have the modern way. And the modern way is done with what is called the implicit consumer's feedback. For example, social listing. I'll give you an example of social listing. You can recognize this guy there. Uh, this is my, my Twitter profile. Um, if, you, if you want to stalk me, you can go on my Twitter profile, you can read all the interactions. I do all the things I write, the things I tweet. And uh, if you really, uh, you know, if you have good attention, you will find out that I like this post, which is a, a tweet from uh, Huawei about one of the latest AI features introduced in the P20. So if you can observe this interaction, you can infer that I might be an owner of the P20, or at least I'm a, I'm a potential buyer of P20, okay? And likely, if you look at my followers, you're gonna find that I'm following the Street Triple 665, which is parked just you know a few meters in, in the garage here. Uh, so you can, even if you don't know that I actually own this bike, you can infer that uh, I might be a, a Triumph Motorcycles fan, okay? So, um, what are the advantages? First of all, it's more flexible than more cost, because you decide how many users you want in. It's going to cost you proportionally to how many users, how many interactions you want to collect. Um, you, you, can, you can size it for your business better than service. Um, you get a wider view, because you're not limited to the predefined questions, but you get everything, every possible interaction you can get on the social network, for example, you'll get it. It's more spontaneous. There's no response bias. There are other kind of biases, but it's definitely more spontaneous than asking somebody because you actually have interacted with Huawei, with Triumph. You're not asking, would you buy a motorcycle? No, you actually have interacted with Triumph, so you must be, you probably are, not must, but you probably are a fan of Triumph. And um, you can have mass coverage. Uh, in the United States, 80% of the population is on the social network. So you can cover almost the whole population. And uh, definitely creates new opportunities, better opportunities for big data and AI. Now, the problem is that this is all good if, uh, if you stay within the, for example, the Twitter domain. But what if I want to know, well, I buy on Amazon. No? You have a person, Twitter profile, you want to know what this person buys on Amazon, you're not gonna find. But if you wanna know what beer, brand he shops when he goes to the grocery store. You're not going to find those information in Twitter because this information is not available there. So likely, there is a whole universe of providers for consumers of consumer data sets. So in addition to the social media and like surveys, like market research companies providing you know, survey studies, you have a tons of uh, providers about web cookies, um, e-commerce purchases, you get credit card transactions, you get mobile analytics, Google search. Those are anonymized data, but still are really good from you know aggregated insights of on, not an individual one, but you know to get a, a picture of how the population is behaving. Uh, and the same thing also happens for um, information about like financial and properties, for example. So now imagine you have access to all of those different data sets and all that. It would cost you a lot 
But let's suppose that you can get all of them. Now, what do you do next? The problem with those data set is that each one is scattered and it only provides a partial view of the individuals. And sometimes some of those sources, they're not even representative. They're skewed uh, compared to the whole population. Because uh, just to give an example, the social users on the social networks have a younger age. Like if you look at the demographic distribution, they're much younger than the average American. So they're not completely, you know, they're not enough individually. So, the holy grail of market research, and this is the biggest challenge of market research, is how do we find our only one complete and representative data set that contains everything you can possibly know about the, cons the population of consumers? This is the challenge we're going to address tonight. Now, uh, is this something completely new? Well, no, I mean, marketers are already working in this industry many, for many years. So what is the current baseline, the baseline algorithm for completing data sets? We'll, we will see the uh, algorithm called the lookalike fusion. So for those of you who are, you know, I grew up with Dragon Ball uh, cartoons, then you probably can remember when Goku and Trunk, what was the name, can't remember, then they were doing this fusion. So it's exactly the same process. Uh, except that you don't become Super Saiyan afterwards. So the, the lookalike look fusion uh, consists in, you pick two, two data sets, uh, and in this example we have on the left a, a panel of social network uh, users, and on the right we have a panel of uh, consumption survey, like those are the people that you, know, you ask questions, and on the left you have the people you're crawling from some social network. And then from these two panels, you pick one individual, uh, and then you group all, the, all of the, the individuals from both sides, you group them by common demographics. Because you never want to match a, a woman living in California with a man living in the New York. So you, you never want to mismatch demographics. So you group them by common demographics, and then um, you, you link them based on common interest. So in, in this example, we can see they both uh, interact with New York Times, uh, Coca-Cola, and they both are Democrats, uh, or at least they interact with Democrats, uh, politicians. Um, so once you've done the match, this is simply uh, an optimization problem, uh, an assignment uh, optimization problem. There are many solutions out there. And after you've created this link, you end up with something like that. Uh, so you take the two data sets and you stack them vertically, where now, once you have done this uh, stacking, you can start with asking questions like, how the audience like Stranger Things? Stranger Things, it, it's, a, it's an entity, a page that exists in the social network, but it does not exist in the, in the, in the survey. We forgot to ask, do you watch the Stranger Things? So if I only had the data on the right, I wouldn't be able to answer the question how the audience of Stranger Things looks like. So then all I have to do, I have to link with the social network panel, then I select the individuals using the Stranger Things information from the left data set, and then through the lookalike process, I get insights on the, all the meaning variables on the right, for example, if they use MasterCard for shopping, or if they buy Ben & Jerry's ice cream. The problem of this approach is that as long as you use only a couple of sources, it works fine. But as soon as you start adding multiple data sets, it creates a sort of star uh, schema where um, everything is linked with a central panel. So if you want to link, again, Twitter with, for example, the e-commerce on the bottom, the green one, then you have uh, two, that, two fusions. You have to fuse Twitter with the central panel and then the central panel with the e-commerce. So that doesn't scale. So the problem with the fusions is that they're very accurate but they don't scale very well, uh, especially when there are differences in feature space. So the two data sets are very different from each other. When and every time you have a new uh, data coming in, like the same data set but fresh data, get some updates, then you rerun the fusion process and you always get end up with something that's slightly different. So you always always have to do a little bit of craftsmanship to make it work. And uh, 
the, the biggest bottleneck is that it's an optimization problem. You need to have an objective function to optimize, and it has to be one universal objective function for every possible domain. And that's simply impossible. So, is there a more scalable way to fuse data sets? This is what the audience projection was designed for. The audience projection can be seen as a binary classification problem where we classify users, like yes or no. Yes, you are part of the target. No, you are not part of the target. And uh, I'll show you with this animation. Um, same example, social network, source, domain. We, if we get uh, your panel, which represents roughly 70 million users, for example. This is just the example of Twitter. And on the right, we have a survey that supposedly represents 200 million users. Now, you start by defining the target audience in Twitter, and uh, you end up by selecting roughly 1.6 million users out of the 70 millions. And if you stay within the same domain, there's a lot of things you can, a lot of insights. For example, you might know that this audience is uh, mostly female, um, is young, they are interested to punk music, uh, they are gamers, they watch two horror movies, and then they're also interested in sci-fi and fantasy, for example. And this is the information you can get from the original, the source domain, right? You don't need the audience projection for that. The reason why you need the audience projection is that, is that you take this target, and then now you select the subset of users in the destination domain, such that you can answer questions like, okay, the people who interact on the social network with Stranger Things, then they buy Ben & Jerry's uh, ice cream uh, in the last day, both in the last six months. They, they, they didn't use MasterCard that much because the affinity is, is not that high, but they definitely watch two Bob's Burgers, for example. Those are information that you wouldn't have in the source domain. You can only get through the projection process. Uh, the way it works very high level is that you take the, the individual domains, for example, in the social pages and the questions in the survey, and then you run a name entity recognition algorithm to extract the entities. You get all the entities you can from the different domains, and then you link them together um, using an entity linking algorithm. And then the next step is to apply this Bayesian model that will be will allow you to define the audience in one domain and then project to the other. And now we're going to see in detail how all of those steps work. Okay. First of all, why entities? Entities are great because entities represent a universal feature space. No matter what the data set is, the entities all exist regardless. If we're talking about Nike, Adidas, they exist in the social world, they exist, they exist in the e-commerce, they exist everywhere. So the entities exist in the real world regardless of the data set. And we're going to leverage that information. Let's see an example of how we do the entity recognition. If, if I open this Coca-Cola and Company Twitter profile, I'm going to find this description. The Coca-Cola Company is a total beverage company offering over blah, 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 blah. Now, the algorithm has to find out that in this body of text, the Coca-Cola Company is the entity. So this, this is what the entity recognition is about. Feed in some raw text and then tag the parts of the text that actually represent some entity. And in, the, this, in the Twitter, it's very simple because you have, a, for example, Elon Musk is Elon Musk. So there's nothing to extract. It's already an entity. Uh, but sometimes you like Nike, just do it. So you want to know that Nike is the entity and just do it as the headline. It becomes a little bit tricky when you work with questions like, did you use a MasterCard credit card for personal purpose? Have you rented a Hummer SUV car in the last six months? And you want to be able to know that uh, all, if you answer yes to this question, you have interacted somehow with the entity which is represented in the text. When you work with e-commerce, you can either use the product description or you can take some customer review. Like in those examples, in the Adidas hat or the Coca-Cola fridge. And the entity recognition algorithm will just be able to 
you know, highlight what the entities are. Um, how do you do that? Uh, simply, you don't need to call, you don't need to implement any new algorithm, need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, fortunately, there are a lot of NLP libraries out there. Uh, and one of the most famous one, and the one that we selected for our use case, is Spacey. Spacey, we selected Spacey uh, mostly for two reasons. First of all, is uh, is, a, is a Python library, and we have the whole backend in Python. Uh, it contains state-of-the-art algorithms, so very high industry-grade maturity. So it's adopted by a lot of companies, and it's both fast and accurate at the same time. So this unique combination of features for this library uh, made our decision. Um, we're not going to speak in detail about the algorithm now, but at the end of my talk, there will be Alberto, who is a more NLP specialist, will, that will give you some extra insights about exactly how, how the algorithm works. Uh, I'm only limiting, uh, no, in this, in this slide, I want to show you how easy it is to use Spacey. All you have to do is to create a, what is called a line file here, for the NLP. Uh, you, you specify the language, English. Then take a row text, a string. You feed the string inside the NLP object, and you get back a doc object, which is a structured document from where you can extract the noun phrases, the verbs, the entities, and so on. So very easy, few milliseconds done. Now, let, let's think about one problem that may happen with this approach. If you have different spellings of the same entity, it's not going to, the, just the name entity recognition is not enough. Because you cannot distinguish between the Coca-Cola company and Coca-Cola, they will both be extracted as entity, but it doesn't know that this, this is actually the same thing, just with different spelling. So we need something more. We need an additional step, which is the linking and normalization. Likely, there is Wikipedia out there, it is free, and uh, you can just download a copy here. There are a bunch of services you can use as an API. So if you, if you extract the entities and you try to resolve them in Wikipedia, uh, for example, the, all of the different D Coca-Cola or Coca-Cola, they will all end up resolved into the Coca-Cola Wikipedia page. Right. But when you, when you do it with the Coca-Cola company, on Wikipedia, there's a different entry for the company. So there still are different entities. But Wikipedia provides relationships among the pages. So you can leverage those relationships to end up with, OK, those two pages actually refer to the same thing. So you're going to merge them together under a single entity. Now. Now that we are able to take any data sets and then extract the entities and normalize them, we have this situation here. You start with the raw features and then you project into a common feature space where, for example, in this case, you have Coca-Cola, McDonald, and New York Times in the middle, which are entities that exist in both domains. And then there are some entities like Elon Musk, Stranger Things, PlayStation, that don't exist in one domain and the same thing for MasterCard, for example. The only, let's suppose that there's no MasterCard page on social network. Okay. Now, when you, the, the, the final result is slightly different with the lookalike fusion. In the lookalike fusion, we stack vertically, but here we stack them, we conquer them horizontally. So you have on, on the top, you have the source domain, and the bottom, you have the destination domain. You can divide the columns which represent your features based on what entities are only exist in one domain, what exists only in the other domain, and what is in common. Now we can answer questions like, if uh, my target audience is defined by Stranger Things, I'm going to use the information on uh, this girl here. OK? And then I'm going to look at the common entities information, and I'm going to use that information to select who are the users in the destination domain, which is the two guys right here, OK? I'll show you more in a, in, a, in a more structured example. So the process is start with one domain, get the common entities, extract some information that we call the share of interest. Uh, we'll, we're going to see what the share of interest is. This is, uh, you can think of like aggregated statistics about the common entities. And then you, you feed this into a Bayesian model together with uh, information, any possible information you can get from the source domain. So 
the, the, the information from the source domain will represent your prior. And this share of interest is what in the Bayesian formulation is the evidence. And the ultimate goal is to learn how to predict who are the users that look like the source target audience. For those of you who are not statisticians or have not uh, a lot of experience with Bayesian modeling, uh, this is going to, to look a little bit more com a little bit complicated, but it's, in the end, it's, it's not nothing really hard to grasp. If you want to ask uh, questions at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll give you more details, more explanations. Um, if you if you remember the bias rule, the bias rule says that uh, if our goal is to get the probability of the user to belong to the target audience, which in our case is defined by Stranger Things, given by the evidence that we represented using the pi. The pi here is the what we call the share of, share of interest of the common entities. So you just you can reverse the formula as the likelihood times the prior divided by the evidence. This is just a mathematical formulation. Uh, we're not inventing anything. We're just applying the math. Now we're going to see those different bits here are calculated. So the most important part is the evidence. Because the evidence for us is it's like DNA. It's the encoding of the audience. No matter how you have defined the audience in the source domain, you grab some statistics about the common entities. And then those statistics, the pi representation, is your encoding that you will reuse in the other domain to reconstruct back what are the individuals that might look like this audience. Okay, so this is the common step that we use for projection. And um, um, what statistics? It's very easy. Let's suppose that the Stranger Things uh, target comes 70% from the McDonald target, meaning that 70% of the McDonald users are also part of the uh, target. So they both do. McDonald and Stranger Things. And the same thing for Coca-Cola. We know that those users come 50% from Coca-Cola, 50% from the New York Times, and 17 from McDonald. Now the list can be very, very, very long. Okay? And the, just those numbers here are enough to be able to predict in the destination domain which individual should be in target and which one should not. Um, next step is to decompose, further decompose the evidence. This is the law of total probability. So if you're not familiar with it, just another mathematical decomposition. We're not inventing anything, just applying the math. Um, the evidence can be rewritten in this way. So you can, uh, it's just a sum of what is called the positive likelihood and the negative likelihood. Okay. Um, and the positive likelihood, in case that, uh, in this example, we only have one uh, entity for the evidence, let, let's focus one entity per time. Let's suppose that we want to know what's the probability that a random user in the destination domain is part of the target of Stranger Things. Given that, 70% of the McDonald users should be in that target. Okay? Now, if the user, uh, based on the, uh, whether the user is or not in McDonald in the destination domain, we will assign a probability uh, following a binomial distribution. And then you repeat the same thing for the positive and the negative one, you sum them together. Um, but there is another an extra step you have to pay attention to. The, the binomial distribution you can be used for calculating one single marginal uh, evidence. But let's suppose that you have many, 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 many different entities. Then now you need to make an assumption. Uh, you need to be very smart on making sure that the assumption holds. And the naive assumption is that if the entities are independent given the, the user membership, then you can factorize them this way. So the joint probability becomes the multiplication of the individual marginal ones. So the first, each individual one uh, it comes from a binomial distribution, then just multiply together, and then you get the joint distribution for the likelihood. Now, don't focus much on the, on the technical details. I just wanted to the goal was to say, oh, we have a model for that. Uh, it's not just black box magic. Uh, if you want to know more, we'll explain to you. But also, we don't want you to spend two hours explaining all those little math details. This is a patient formulation that 
goes from, uh, takes the evidence from the source domain and spits out the projected user probabilities. And then from the probabilities, you can derive all of the insights of all of the, the variables that are only available in the destination domain. Because now you, you have selected a chunk of users from the survey panel. And on this uh, chunk of users, you can learn things like Bob's Burgers, or the fact that they also watch to Tinic with very high affinity, and they, they own, some of them own a Nintendo DS, they play two video games, they use audio and video chat, and they don't use much MasterCard. So those are the kind of insights that are very key for uh, strategic decisions for marketers. Uh, okay, let me recap. In a nutshell, the audience projection is Start with the source domain, which is the social panel in this example, and you get as much as information you can from the individual data set. Okay? Just a standalone data set. Then extract the common entities, link them together with Wikipedia, calculate some statistics about those common entities, that is the pie there, the evidence, feed everything into this Bayesian model, and get out the insights in the destination domain. This is, in a nutshell, what the audience projection is about. Now, you might think that I might also be fooling you that, okay, this all seems cool, but this, does it actually work? So how do you know that this actually works? Yeah. So there, there are, uh, we had, one of the biggest challenges of, of, of this audience projection was, okay, how do we actually test that this is actually accurate? So we had to, we spent a lot of time thinking about evaluation techniques, okay? Um, the basic principles is that the audience projection is a binary classification problem. So we, you can evaluate whether it's accurate or not following standard uh, binary classification technique. So uh, the model gives you the probabilities. It goes from between zero and one. And you can either plot the ROC curve to get the area under the curve or any other fancy metric you want, or in the case in the bottom, you can threshold the prediction, say everything above 0, 0.5 is going to be true, and everything below 0, 0.5 is going to be false, and you can build your confusion matrix and calculate accuracy in the traditional way. But the main problem is ground truth. Where, where, where am I going to find the ground truth for comparing the probabilities of my model of the audience projection with the true ones, okay? We're gonna see a few techniques. The most straightforward one is to um, validate on common entities, because let's suppose in this example, the target audience is everybody who have interacted with Coca-Cola or McDonald's on the social networks. Then you select the users, you project them in the destination domain, and then you repeat exactly the same query in the destination domain, so you have the true persons who have you know, actually responded true to Coca-Cola, yes, I drink Coca-Cola, yes, I eat at McDonald's, and then you have the predictions of the projection. So because you have this information available, you can ignore to have this information, make the projection, and then just compare the two results. That's the, the easiest one. The uh, a slightly more uh, complicated one is when you validate using self-reconstruction within the same domain. What does it mean is that you start with, uh, in that case, the panel uh, of the survey, and then you divide in six chunks. The first chunk, uh, horizontally, you divide in source and destination users, but actually they are from the same data set. So the gray zones here are uh, information that you do have available, but you mask them from the model, you don't show it to the model. So you only use the information from the source users on common entities to project, to select which users you want the destination one, but then you repeat the same query because now you have this information and then you compare the two different pre uh, projections. A third one is to, um, you can pick any combination of data sets. You can start from the main one, you project to the middle domain, and then you project back to the, to the, to the domain uh, A, and uh, you want to have the same results. Like the same users that I selected at the beginning, when I go back to my original domain, 
I want to compare the projections and they have to match. So this is a third approach. Every time you do uh, an evaluation is one test case, meaning that you need to define one target audience and then you get one accuracy evaluation. Then you define, instead of stranger things, you define, uh, for example, uh, the GoPro audience and then you get another accuracy. So for each single audience you project, you get the evolution of how accurate was the projection. So you need to run a lot of test cases to get you know, an ensemble of accuracy metrics, averaging them, plotting the distribution. So it's really important that you stratify by categories. Like you want to have some test cases about digital products, some of them about news and media, some of them about uh, cooking shows, fitness, magazines, and so on. So you have to be able to cover all the different scenarios. Another thing that you can uh, recognize is to know if your projection was was good, is that if Stranger Things looked like on the left, on, on the social network, then you do the projection, and then you analyze the demographics after projection, you want them to be not, not exactly the same, but they have to be close enough. If you get that the Stranger Things on social network is mostly female, you project, and you end up with 90% males, there's something wrong, okay? So that either there's something wrong about your model or the data is simply not compatible with each other. And uh, lastly, there are a bunch of resources that some of them you have to pay for getting those reports. Some of them are uh, accessible for free, uh, like Statista, the Pew Research Center. They publish a lot of studies, market research studies. So you can get some of them you can try to replicate the same study within your, with the data you have, and then instead of comparing the, the probabilities of the binary classification, you actually calculate the final insights, you make sure that the insights make sense. Now they, they, they tell you the same things. Okay, so those are all the different things you can do to test that the audience projection works. And I want to just briefly mention all the different opportunities. With the audience projection, this is what we have achieved now. We started with a uh, uh, great population, like the, the census population of the United States, and now we got different layers sampling from the same uh, source population, but each layer gives you some insights about some particular details about one persona. So they all together, they give a lot of information, but what we are adding is the link, how I go, how I move from one layer to another, because those have no personal identifiers you can use for, you know, projecting one to another. So you need to have an algorithm that says those individuals on the layer, in the gray layer, are the same individuals on the orange one, for example. Another application of audience projection is that if you, in the case of Stranger Things, uh, if you want to analyze whether they read or buy the magazine Game Informer, Game Informer is a variable that is available in the, the social network, the survey questions, and the e-commerce. So it's available in all three domains. That means you get three different sites, and if those insights, they all point to the same direction, means that your strategy is very strong. Like if you have one saying, yeah, very high affinity, and another one saying, no, it's very low affinity, it's probably noise, okay? But if all three point to the same direction, means that your strategy is really strong. And ultimately, this is more of a, an invite for the whole scientific and technical community, is to take the audience projections. You have to see it as a particular, um, a particular uh, problem of the general one, which is the cross-domain adaptation problem. So I hope that you, you got inspired by this framework, this uh, technique, and you will try to use those uh, techniques in your work or for your projects in a different context for a different, completely different use case. And hopefully, maybe we'll have a lot of researchers doing, you know, working on the audience projection as an alternative way for solving the domain adaptation problem. So, let me conclude. So, the, as we've seen, the major problem of marketers is to find this only one uh, single data set that is impossible to find. So, uh, you can do the lookalike fusions, but they don't scale. What we propose is that you can use both entities. You can use the named entity recognition algorithms that are really advanced. Nowadays, the state of the art is really high. Inside a Bayesian formulation, and you get this projection. 
that with proof that uh, can be tested to be accurate, such that we now achieve our goal, which is providing marketers with insights from multiple perspectives, such that now they have the full, complete view of the consumers. And that's it. Thank you very much. If you want, you can ask questions. I need a uh, assistant. Very great talk. Um, mine is just a curiosity on uh, sampling from census data. So I guess from census data, you know that there's I don't know a thousand people living in a certain zip code. I was wondering how you go about sampling those. How, I guess you use Twitter as a, as, a, as a big source. How do you know that you get from people that actually are living at that zip code? Do you basically use the demographic information that people leave on Twitter or? you do something more, a bit more complicated. Okay, so in this talk, so, so, Sorry, second question. That, oh. that leads to the next question, which is, if we move to Europe, how do you go about the, the legal framework? Is that legal to do in Europe, like the massive web scraping of user information from Twitter? Okay, so uh, the first answer is the, uh, the, the goal of the talk was to present the audience projection, so we didn't spend any time. Uh, we, we assume that we know somehow the demographics, um, depending on the source, sometimes it's already available. Like any Twitter profile has the location field, you can parse out. Um, there are different ways to get data in legal way. I mean, um, there are terms of services uh, that you have to respect. There are certain things you cannot do depending on what the data provider says. So as long as you stay within you know, what the rules are, then you can use machine learning for predicting, for inferring. You can get it from external sources. I mean, nowadays data is a commodity where you get from disparate ways. So, um, yeah, European has a different regular uh, rules than the US. So all you have to do is to make sure that you're compliant with those rules. But that doesn't mean that it's not possible. When you mentioned uh, Wikipedia, the linking ambiguity, what do you mean by the fact that the Coca-Cola company and Coca-Cola are connected to, like, together? How do you find, find it out? <coughs> so if I open the Wikipedia page, you see I already opened that. <laughs> so there you go, the Coca-Cola yeah, Sure, but uh, then it is connected to even other entities sure. that are not uh, like it wouldn't it be better to use dbpedia which has the uh, yeah. so dbpedia is just a wrapper on wikipedia it's a more structured yeah. wikipedia so I, I didn't mention dbpedia to not introduce too many you know uh, information uh, at, at the base you have the wikipedia and then you can either write your own logic for and uh, link an entity so you can use dbpedia but dbpedia i found it a bit hard to it's not maintained anymore uh, there are some companies maintaining it, but you have to pay. But the free DBpedia is quite old. And one of the requirements for uh, like Helixa is that we feed new entities uh, every day or every week. So we are we always up to date with the market trends. And sometimes those information are not... Uh, DBpedia is always uh, a little bit late compared to the Wikipedia. So mm -hmm. you can use it, but you cannot rely on 100%. Thank you. Hey there. Hey. Hey, yeah, thanks. It was really interesting, actually. Um, if you've got a bit of time, you said you could go into more detail about, was it the model 
that was used for predicting the the prior distribution of the share interest given the user rights Stranger Things. Okay. So you have the naive assumption, but I guess you don't use that. Uh, well, what I'm presenting is uh, the baseline of the algorithm to give you. It's not important how we implement it specifically. Yeah. It's more to give you, you know, what's the idea behind the framework, and then also the share of interest thing about bi binomial distribution. This is the first implementation we did, uh, but actually there are much more advanced version based on more machine learning to learn how to map the predictions, which is not based on the naive assumption. Um, but this is more uh, intellectual property. So we thought that, I mean, we wanted to share the whole methodology that the concept is that the prior is whatever information you get from the source, the target in the source domain, and then every aggregated statistics on the common entities is the evidence, and then how you formulate that in a Bayesian form is, is, is doesn't have to follow these rules. We just proposed this one because it was the easiest one to present. Okay, cool. But at, uh, at the bottom of the presentation, we will pre when we publish the recordings, there is a, an appendix with more explanations about the patient model. I just don't want to, I see people, <laughs> maybe we'll start sleeping if we start talking about the math, but if you want, we can discuss after. Are you gonna publish anything? Yes, the, uh, well, we're already <laughs> live on YouTube, but next week, uh, this is going to be presented at Riley, so they will also publish it eventually, so, right. and we will do it as well. Thanks. Okay, so if there are other questions, because we have Alberto Piron, which is my colleague, uh, yeah, we will get to that. So after this question, we will have some, if you have a question about the entity recognition, Alberto is going to explain your <coughs> deep learning algorithm behind. So keep that, keep those questions for Alberto. Yeah, just very fast, two issues. The first, in your experience, in which kind of fields the model performs better and in which one it fails? I mean, uh, by sector or by uh, kind of uh, entity uh, recognition. Second, is it useful also to predict in some way trends? So I mean more change rather than uh, audience or target audience and penetration and so on? Okay, so that's a good question because this is actually the, the version 2.0 of the algorithm which you are working on. Um, so you spot it. The, um, first of all, when it works well, uh, I picked two examples like social network and survey, and that probably not the best. Uh, I mean, if I have to pick a pair, uh, probably two social networks. So, the, like any cross domain adaptation problem, the closer the domains are, the more similar, the more eff effective the method is. So, uh, that is the general rule in every ad ad adaptation problem. The second question about how do you spot trends, uh, you want to enrich this methodology with um, what we call the augmentation technique, which is mostly based on, um, I don't know if you are um, uh, experienced with collaborative filtering and matrix uh, factorization. Those techniques that generally use for recommender systems can be used for uh, learning uh, patterns that you do not observe in the raw data. And then they go very well together with your bits projection. Okay, because the bits is also here, we want to be very quick, otherwise bits is going to get cold. So I'll invite my colleague Alberto here, that is going to explain us a little bit for the deep learning, you know, uh, enthusiast. Nowadays you cannot have a, a talk about data science machine learning if you don't have some deep learning content. So it's, it's a must. So, so there you go. Uh, good evening. My name is Alberto Pirovano and I am a machine learning engineer at Elixa. Uh, in this part of the talk, we will see the uh, SPACE neural entity recognition model. Um, this model is wrapped in SPACE, it is a library for uh, natural language processing. Um, <coughs> uh, SPACE wraps uh, every natural language processing task in, um, in a pipeline. A pipeline takes a text as, it, as the, the input, raw text, and applies uh, a sequence of um, uh, components of models on it. Uh, and outputs a document that contains uh, a set of metadata uh, containing the predictions of these models. As an example, we have the input text here. It is Mark Whitney visited Mars. 
um, and if we run the pipeline, uh, we, we will get the output of the parser, that is the tree, the um, syntactical tree, assigning uh, uh, roles to each word. And if we run uh, the other component, we will have the entity recognition uh, output, that is the set of entities that are present inside uh, our, our input. And the document, uh, at the end, will contain the, this set of entities, the uh, tree, and all the, all the metadata that the model uh, have predicted. The model is based on four blocks. The first is the embedding, then we have the encoding, attention, and prediction. The embedding model um, takes words and assigns to each word the context-independent uh, vector. These vectors are built and learned in such a way that um, words that, that are similar in uh, their meaning are close together in the hidden space. Uh, the, the encoding has the role of taking these context-independent vectors uh, and uh, build uh, context-sensitive representations. These representations can be matrices, vectors, or tensors. And the attention, instead, uh, is a block that takes the input, uh, combines it with a, a vector, and uh, extracts only what is important uh, for the final task. In this case, we want to um, keep in our representation only what is important to predict the entities. So this step will uh, select some features from the input. And the prediction uh, takes all this, get, this set of representations uh, and generates the list of entities. Um, the first step is the embedding works uh, this way. So each, each token uh, is extracted of four features. The lowercase uh, um, word, the prefix, the suffix, and the shape, all these features are then embedded in a vector and are concatenated in a long, uh, big vector. Uh, this method is applied in order to have a vector that is meaningful also for words that are not frequent, uh, but that have uh, a common, uh, a, a frequent prefix or suffix. This way we, we will have a vector that is meaningful also for them. Um, then on, uh, in Cascade we have um, the hash embedding framework that allows us to not have the, to deal with the, um, the vocabulary. The vocabulary is a big deal in natural language processing uh, because it can be very, very large. And with hash embeddings, uh, we don't have to think about it because the hash embedding takes each word and assigns uh, to each word an index. It is a bucket between uh, 1 and B, and assigns to each word a vector that is related to that index. So every word has a, a vector um, if we don't consider all the others. And um, in Spacey, we don't use a single um, hash function, but we have n hash functions ending up with uh, n vectors combined together with a deep learning model uh, that is the, the step over here. Um, and at the end, we will get the, the final vector. Uh, the second step is the encoding. The encoding takes uh, um, the uh, context-independent vectors uh, and uh, extracts a context-sensitive representation. To do this, we take each word and the context that surrounds the word, in this case, the tetragram centered <coughs> on Whitney, and we stack uh, the context-independent vectors uh, of Mark, Whitney, and Visited all together to get uh, this, uh, this matrix. Then we apply a ResNet-like uh, transformation to get uh, the enriched tetragram matrix uh, that is a, a um, context-sensitive representation of the word Whitney. So, as it expresses how Whitney is placed inside the context in which it is. The uh, third block is the attention mechanism. So the uh, context-sensitive representation will be used by the downstream model. These models can be polluted with a lot of information. So what we want to do is to um, select from the, uh, the feature we have only what is important. This is done in NLP with the attention vector. The attention vector can be learned, like in uh, machine translation. But with this model, the attention vector is uh, built with uh, uncrafted features that can be the number of entities that have been extracted uh, so far, or the words that, that um, we have to pass. So at the end, we have this trigger matrix that is turned into a vector that contains only what is important for the task. So now we will see how the process works. Uh, each word is encoded in the trigger matrix and is combined with the attention vector. At the beginning, the attention vector is uh, random or empty, and we get the enriched trigram vector, as we said. So this is the encoding plus attention step for the word, uh, for a specific word. On top of this, 
We have a classifier that predicts three actions, uh, shift, out, and reduce. Shift means that the world is an entity, is part of an entity. Out means that the world is not part of an entity, while uh, reduce means that the world is the end of the entity. The algorithm works with three containers, three objects, that are the stack, the buffer, and the segment. This is a, a high-level overview uh, of the algorithm. If we take the, um, the sentence uh, we had before, so Mark Whitney visited Mars, uh, at the beginning all the words are placed inside uh, our buffer. Then we, we select a word, the word mark, we get the uh, trigger matrix, the attention vector, and we predict an action that is a shift, that means moving mark from the buffer to the stack. Then we update the attention vector, saying, OK, we have an entity that can be extracted. Um, so the vector now changes. We go ahead with Whitney, and uh, we get, again, its own trigger matrix with the new vector of attention, and we predict shift. That means uh, we move uh, also the surname in the stack. We update again the attention vector, and we go to visited. So we, we pass the sentence in sequence. Visited as its own uh, uh, matrix, uh, the context-sensitive context uh, representation. We combine it with the attention vector, and we predict uh, the action reduce. That means that we selected uh, and we found our first entity, that is uh, Mark Whitney, that is a person. So we, we have the last uh, the action reduce that says, OK, the, the words that, that are present inside the stack are an entity. We update the attention vector to signal the model that we have an entity, a new entity. And uh, we stick with the, uh, so after the reduce section, we stick with the three gram matrix which we had before, but we update the attention vector with the information we just have. So we have another prediction for visited, that is out, it means okay, visited is not an entity, and we extract it uh, as a non-entity. And uh, we update again the attention vector, we go to Mars, not literally, but uh, we take mass, we get the matrix, the new vector, and uh, we predict uh, shift. That means, okay, Mars can be an entity. We update the vector, and uh, <coughs> we, we, we stick with, uh, again with the uh, representation of uh, the word Mars, uh, and we predict, again, re reduce. That means this is another entity, and we extract uh, the second entity. So this is a process that takes uh, input text, uh, raw text. Uh, this is the inference phase. Clearly, it's not the, the training phase. And um, predicts our uh, set of entities from the input text. So this model, the official explanation of this model is uh, at this link. So there is a YouTube video that explains uh, in detail how this model works. This is a, an overview. So if you want to, to see this video, is present in this slide, and you can uh, go to the link and uh, watch it. Thank you. It is, it's not an appendix of this. Thank you. Uh, Questions? We have Questions? Questions, which is not about the pizza. <laughs> okay, no question. Um, how do you evaluate the accuracy of this, uh, of this model in your application? And if the accuracy is not too high, how does this impact the downstream part of the model, which uh, Jamal explained before? So in, in our uh, application, we have uh, the description from which we extract the entities. Clearly, we know which are the entities that are present in the description for a, for a little set. We apply this model to this set, uh, to the input, and we see, OK, which are the entities we extract, and we compare literally with uh, a ground tool that we, that we have that is made with domain knowledge uh, or also other algorithms uh, that are present, uh, also other algorithms that can be applied and, and uh, we can compare the, uh, the output, basically, yes. Well, when you get the model from space, it's already trained. So the only thing you can do is you can provide additional uh, training samples and it fine tunes for your specific use case. But Spacey already, the developers in Spacey already did a great job for finding out tons of data and testing it. So all the accuracies are already available if you read the, the documentation. So 
being quite strong, quite reliable. <coughs> My question is for Jam for you, Jam Mario. Yes. Yes. Can I can I ask? Yeah. Uh, you said that you collect data from social media, and uh, my question is, how do you collect them? How do you distinguish the reliable data and the irrelevant data to your uh, to your use? I'm not the data engineer, but uh, the data engineers are in the room, so if you want, you can ask them. <laughs> they know better than me the, the, the technical details of how to crawl the data. Uh, probably not the best person. Uh, but the, how do you know that this user is actually a good consumer? It's not like a troll or a bot. Um, we implement the classifiers for that. Um, if you take celebrities, for example, uh, you know they are real persons. Well, there are a few certain Twitter accounts where you can be sure that they are eligible persons and then some of them you're not very certain about. So you can use those for training based on their activity, whether oh this activity looks suspicious or not. So we are re-implementing what Twitter already probably implemented, which is like the fake accounts detection, so we we'll just redo it. Not that complicated. Done? Okay? Right. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much.